Welcome back to Unit 7 for AP Psych. This lesson is on hunger, motivation, and also eating. So uh, basically what happens is uh, every time you notice your stomach growling, of course, it's a, the most inopportune, embarrassing, horrible time. I can't really think of another time where my stomach has actually growled. Where this begins with hunger regulation is with the study from a man called Walter Cannon. And so Walter Cannon uh, discovered a relationship between stomach contraction and a desire for hunger back in uh, 1912. This is the same Walter Cannon that is responsible for the fight or flight, as well as the cannon barred theory of motion, which we'll be looking at in a few lessons. Walter Cannon had a theory that the stomach contractions caused hunger. And so he learned this was not the case after there were some individuals who were studied who had their stomachs removed for whatever reason. Sometimes people have various stomach cancers, other problems where the stomachs are removed. And as a result, do they still feel hunger? The answer is yes, they still feel hunger. And so he discovered that the relationship was between stomach contraction and hungers as a desire. However, stomach contractions do not cause hunger. Take a look at this cool gif. Wow. Let's watch that one more time. Super neat. All right. So how does the brain actually regulate hunger? So there's an area of the brain uh, here. I've abbreviated the LH and VMH. This is the lateral hypothalamus and the ventromedial hypothalamus. These are believed to be the on and off switches for uh, hunger regulation in the brain. However, more specifically, what we're gonna look at is the arcuate nucleus, which is where we have hunger signals, and then the paraventricular nucleus, which is where we have satiety signals. Satiety is kind of a strange word that people don't usually use. You would normally just say, um, I'm experiencing no longer the desire of feeling hungry, or I'm satisfied. But a satiety signal basically is indicative of the fact that you're no longer hungry. So this is found in the paraventricular nucleus. By the way, these are all parts of the hypothalamus. So you can see some of the areas diagrammed here on the map. Hypothalamus responsible for the five Fs. That's fighting, fleeing, hopefully you know the others, feeding, Fahrenheit, and then lastly, sex. What about digestive regulation? So uh, glucose and hormones are the next topics. Glucose is a simple sugar and energy source found in your blood. Glucostatic theory suggests that fluctuations in blood glucose level are monitored in the brain where they influence the experience of hunger. Simply put, what this means is that if your body is not detecting enough energy, enough glucose found in your blood, you're probably gonna have the experience of being hungry. Your body may actually try to digest some food particles that are in your body, looking to extract energy from those. That's simple energy, simple uh, sugar source. That's the glucose. So if you don't have anything in you, of course, you should then have the experience of hunger in order to promote filling your body with nutrition, filling your body with something that is going to allow for this energy source to be extracted. While looking at this, of course, we can't ignore the ideas of hormonal regulation. So we have some hormones that are used to increase appetite, as well as some that are used to decrease your appetite. One of the hormones experienced to increase your appetite is known as ghrelin. Ghrelin is actually when you have an empty stomach, it causes contractions and that sends hunger signals to your brain. So when you have not had any food in a little while and you're sitting around and then your stomach's actually contracting, these empty stomach contractions are sin signaling to your brain that you should eat some food. You've also got orexin, which is a hunger trigger hormone secreted by the hypothalamus, again, to promote the idea that your body is looking to nourish itself, so eat some food. When it comes to decreasing appetite, we have many more hormones. So you've got insulin, which is secreted by the pancreas, one of your body's most vital organs. This is actually needed to extract glucose from the bloodstream. So uh, this is what makes something like pancreatic cancer quite fatal. This is because this process allows you to basically experience having energy without having 
the pancreas functioning correctly without getting this insulin secreted by the pancreas, it's very difficult to extract glucose from your blood as this is a vital and necessary process of the body. We also have a hormone called leptin. Leptin is what regulates the body's energy homeostasis. It's found in fatty tissue. And as a result, the more fatty tissue you have, the more recognition of leptin that your body should detect. However, it is possible for people to build up what's called leptin resistance. And basically what happens when you have leptin resistance is the brain stops being accurately aware of how much leptin is actually found in your blood and in your fatty tissue. And as a result, instead of having a decreased appetite, you actually maintain an increased appetite and you may continue to eat and eat and eat through the leptin resistance until you find yourself as an obese person. It's also possible that you literally eat yourself to death. You eat so much food. Your body is growing at an abnormally fast rate. This causes a heart attack or some obesity related uh, fatality. So again, that's leptin resistance. It is possible that the body can't detect the amount of leptin in the body's fatty tissue. And as a result, then it's unable to detect how much leptin is in the bloodstream. And then lastly, a little bit more basic, but you've got two other ones, PYY and CCK. These are basically decreasing appetite through the feeling of satiety and then no longer having hungry signals, which of course you can read and look at that. All right, we also got some environmental factors. So now that we get out of the biological aspect of hunger regulation, we've got to talk about the environmental factors. There is a lot of environmental factors that impact what we eat, when we eat, how we eat, who we eat with, there's just all kinds of stuff. So first I would like for you to think about what are you gonna eat depending on what's available and its related cues. So for example, if you have a lot of food available, if you go eat at a buffet style restaurant around here, you could go to like a Golden Corral or a Ryan's or I don't know, any other famous buffet. I don't frequent buffets, so I'm not super versed in it, but I've been to a buffet before. Uh, the more food is available, the more food is available there, the more likely you're going to want to eat. Oh, I just thought of an example because I was looking at this picture. Let's think about CC's. CC's pizza, mm -mm good. Or is it? Well, you have to decide. But at the CC's pizza, it's quite cheap and you can eat literally as much as you want. And uh, that's kind of the market mentality for CC's pizza. Some people are going to go in and not eat very much as they're going to make a lot of money off them. Other people are going to go in and they're going to eat a lot, but CC's is still going to make a lot of money because pizzas is uh, generally uh, low cost food. So think about all the different food that could be available. How much would you eat? The point I'm trying to make is that the more food that's available, the more likely you're going to eat more. But there are some factors that go into that. So, for example, what does the food taste like? You might go to CC's and find yourself thinking that the food there is gross. You don't like the pizzas at CC's, so you're not going to eat anything. You might just eat a salad. You might go to a Golden Corral and worry about all the food that's available because a lot of it is under heat lamps. And you might decide, mm, you know, there's a lot available here, but the palatability, the actual taste of the food is not so good. So you don't want to eat a whole lot. So that is a factor. The quantity available generally suggests that the more that is available, the more likely you'll find something that you want and the more that you're going to eat. There's something called the cafeteria diet effect, which basically suggests you go into a cafeteria style restaurant, think about K&W or a cafeteria at a school or college, and you tend to eat the same things over and over because they're always available. But food variety is also a factor. What's called sensory specific satiety is the idea that as you eat a specific food, and I can see here it's a little uh, obscured, but as you eat a specific food, its incentive value declines. When it's someone's birthday and you have birthday cake, it tastes great. Everybody loves a little slice of birthday cake. But that second day when you're eating birthday cake, birthday cake leftovers, it's not quite as good, but it's still pretty good. It's birthday cake. Third day, fourth day, fifth day, you have for some reason got a lot of excess birthday cake. You decide the value kind of goes down. It's not quite as good as it once was that very first day. And so two weeks later, you don't want to still be eating leftover birthday cake. The value has declined. Now, another factor that can impact the food that you eat or how much you eat is the presence of others. So if you're around people that you don't know, depending on 
uh, your gender. Men typically don't discriminate a lot when they're eating food in public. Men typically, whether they're around men or women, whether they know them or not, tend to eat at a normal rate. But women are not exactly the same. Women will actually restrict how much food they would eat in the presence of people that they don't know for fear of judgment, because again, those people don't really know them. But uh, women who are around people that they're tight with, people that they're friendly with, they're typically not going to restrict their food intake. Of course, we've also got not just availability as a factor, but what about conditioning and habits? So, for example, some people like me, I'm a little on the picky side. Uh, I've been conditioned that way. And so there may be foods that could taste great, but based on the way they look, I might decide I just can't eat it. Maybe I've been conditioned in that regard. But uh, maybe I see someone eat that food and I trust that, hey, it's probably OK. So I decide to go for it myself. And then I'm experiencing observational learning when it comes to my food habits. So again, something to consider. Within that, we also have some certain sensitivities to those external cues. So for example, we have uh, two types of cues, both normative and sensory cues to kind of get us in the mindset of uh, when we should eat, how much we should eat, what's appropriate, how much should I eat, or what exactly should I be eating for a specific meal? Those are called normative cues. These are typically dealing with regulations around food, but not the food itself. Sensory cues are the characteristics of the food itself. So for example, if I'm very sensitive to eating desserts or I have a preference for chocolate, that chocolate is a characteristic of the food. Or if I really like sweets, so I eat lots of fruit, or if I really don't mind the bitter taste of many vegetables, that's a sensory cue of the food itself. And then finally, the last topic of food regulation and hunger regulation deals with balancing out the intake and then the energy expenditures. So there's two similar sounding points here to make. One is called set point. The set point is the body's natural point of stability in weight. You may find that you have a very difficult time gaining or losing weight as you age. You might hover in between a certain five to 10 pound range and you can't really uh, grow out of that or get less than that. This is basically your body suggesting that it's found its natural point of stability. So your body has found its set point. Uh, maybe you're stuck in a, a five pound window where again, you just can't really get lower or you can't get higher. That would be your set point. The settling point though is a little different. This one is suggesting that your weight is actually drifting around an appropriate level for the body based on its detection of how much you're actually consuming from a caloric level and then how much energy you're expending. And so this is your body trying to find that equilibrium point and balance you out in a kind of a homeostatic level for how much are you actually eating versus how much are you actually uh, burning or using. And so that is the settling point. And finally, this just brings up a discussion about obesity. This is not a major topic for our class or for this unit, but it is worth mentioning if you've never heard of obesity or terms like BMI, then I would suggest that you take a look at this infographic. But obesity is usually referenced by having a, a body mass index of 30 or higher. Um, you can find out your body mass index by basically using a formula of weight divided by height and then squared. However, Body mass index is not the only way to classify uh, obesity. It's also not that uh, forgiving for someone that might be uh, tall and then kind of a slender person. Um, and so just something to think about, something to consider. Obesity is a uh, preventable disease around the world, but we are, at least in America, kind of a culture that embraces uh, being nice to people and uh, not necessarily calling someone out. We would never go to someone and uh, shame them in their face for being obese. But the reality is obesity is a disease. It is a um, preventable experience to uh, get yourself in a healthy state of mind, but also a healthy state of body. And so there are genetic vulnerabilities, but mostly what I'm trying to say is that obesity does put you at risk. And so knowing that you should do your best to try to live as healthy of a life as possible. That includes both a healthy mind and a healthy body uh, as best you can. 
For now, that's all for Hunger Motivation. I hope you will join me next time as we look into the next topic, and I, I will see you. Adios.